Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India series of uh, the calculus of variations. This is the fourth lecture of the series. Uh, let us recall what we did in the last lecture. We discussed the concept of integration over the domain of x y plane, which gave us the famous theorem, uh, Green's theorem, which is stated that integration over the uh, domain d in the x y plane can be written as the line integral over the boundary of its domain. So, that is what is stated here, the integration over this closed curve uh, of m d x plus n d y. So, this is the line integral here, which is the integration of this function uh, integrand over the boundary c of this domain d, which is equal to the integration of uh, the n x minus m y. Uh, d x d y on the domain d. So, this is what was established in the last lecture and then we extended this, firstly we did it for very simple domain and then we extended it to more general domains like complicated domains like this, which was divided into simpler domains and then added the integrals uh, over those uh, individual subdomains. Then we considered normal derivatives, which is a particular case of uh, directional derivative. Directional derivative in any uh, vector uh, is given by gradient of the function, which is being differentiated along a given vector. So, gradient of that function uh, dot product with the unit vector in the direction in which we are differentiating it. So, in particular, if we take the direction normal direction, so that is what is called normal derivative, which was defined here in this manner. Since the function is defined only inside d, so we took minus of what is usually taken that u of x dash y dash minus u x y over delta n limit delta n tending to 0. So, we took minus of that since the function is defined only inside the domain d. So, that is what will be defined as the directional normal derivative del u by del n, which we have seen that it is a gradient of u dot product with the unit vector in the direction of outward normal, which we had seen. We added and subtracted this u x prime y and then individually these limits uh, were taken here and then we saw that it is nothing but uh, the gradient of u dot n cap. n cap is the unit vector, outward unit vector in the normal direction. Then we consider determinants and various concepts related to determinants and uh, associated system of uh, linear equations. And then we saw that the system has uh, n by n system has uh, a solution if and only if the rank of the matrix is same thing as the rank of the augmented matrix. In case uh, when we have a square system that is n equations and n unknowns, then uh, it is equivalent to saying that uh, determinant of a, uh, because now we can consider determinant. So, determinant a x equal to b, the system has a unique solution if and only if determinant of a is non-zero. And if determinant of a is 0, then a is singular and then the homogeneous system has non-zero solutions and therefore, the non-homogeneous system will have either no solution or infinitely many solutions. Then in the last point of the lecture, we stopped at consideration of nth order uh, ordinary differential equations, which was taken in this form p n x y uh, nth derivative plus p n minus 1. This is also all these p n's are continuous functions of x and they are the coefficients of the various derivatives like p n is the coefficient of highest order derivative the highest order derivative here is n. So, that is why this is nth order ordinary differential equation, 
because it is linear in all these derivatives and on the right hand side we have R x function and if R x is identically 0, we call this homogeneous and if this P n x is never 0 on the interval a b, then we call this equation a regular equation and if P x vanishes either at end points or in the interior of the interval open interval a b, then we call this equation a singular equation. Examples of singular equations are Bessel equations, Legendre equations and various other uh, those uh, equations which cannot be solved in the usual way. Then one goes for power series method and uh, Frobenius method in general to solve those problems. Here we will be considering only the regular problems and here, so we assume that this P n x is not 0 for all x in a b and therefore, this equation can be written as we can divide by P n x throughout and then we get y n x plus P n minus 1 x divided by P n x y n minus 1 x and so on plus P 0 x divided by P n x y equal to R x over P n x. So, this can be rewritten in this form y n x plus a n minus 1 x y n minus 1 x and so on plus a 0 x y equal to here b x, where these a j is p j x over p n x and b x is so j equal to 0, 1, 2 up to n minus 1 and b x equal to r x over p n x. Now, since all these p n's are p n p j x are assumed to be continuous on a b and r x is also assumed to be continuous on a b. So, this would imply that these a j x and b x are continuous on a b. Then we have this Picard's theorem It says that this, let us say this is, we will call it 4.1 now. This is the fourth lecture, so we will call it 4.1 here. So, this equation 4.1 has a unique solution. passing through the point let us say alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n, where alpha n's are li like this, where alpha j's are such that y at x 0 equal to alpha 1, y prime x 0 equal to alpha 2 and up to y n minus 1 x 0 equal to alpha n. Here this x 0 is a point in a b. 
So, that is the Picard's theorem. How do we see this actually? We have this, we introduce these uh, variables y 1 equal to y, y 1 prime equal to y 2 equal to y 1 prime which is nothing but y prime. Similarly, y 3 equal to y 2 prime which is y double prime and so on. So, like this we will have y n as y n minus 1 prime. So, the equation let these variables be taken like this, then we can see that then 4.1 can be rewritten as y n prime equal to we have like this. So, take all the things on the other side, this will be so, this system we will write like this y 1 prime equal to y 2, y 2 prime equal to y 3 and so on from this and so y n prime equal to or rather y n minus prime equal to y n and then y n prime equal to minus so, that is first term is b x minus then you have these terms taken on the other side. So, like this a 0 y 1 minus a 1 y 2 and minus so on 2 you have a n minus 1, n minus 2 rather, n minus 1 and then y n minus 1. Okay. So, a 0 So, like this you have a n minus 1, this is y n here sorry this should be a n minus 1 y n. A 0 y 1, a 1 y 2 and so on up to a n minus 1 y n. So, this is the system of first order equation, each one is a first order equation. So, this the, so this is 4.2. So, 4.1 can equivalently be written as a system of uh, these uh, first order equations and if we introduce this y equal to y 1, y 2, y n transpose that is writing it in as a column vector, then and this matrix A will be, then we can write this like this that y dash equal to this matrix, where you have this is 0, the first term is 0 here, because there is no y 1 here and then 1 here and then 0 0 so on and here then 0 0 1 and 0 like this and then the last one would be, last one would be uh, these terms will come there minus this sorry a 0 minus a 1 up to minus a n minus 1. So, here y 1, y 2 and y n plus you have 0, 0 and up to b. So, this system is written like this y prime equal to this matrix A y plus 
some vector b like this. So, where a is this matrix and b is this vector here. So, this this is the system can be written in a matrix form a vector uh, this is called the matrix form of the equation 4.1, which was equivalently written as 4.2 is a system of first order equation. And so, in matrix form this can be written like this and the initial point. So, this equation is to be satisfied for 0 less than equal to x rather x 0 less than x equal to something. It can be x 1 where x 0 x 1 lie in that interval where x 0 less than equal to x 1 and here x 0 x 1 both belong to a b and y at x 0 is given by the vector alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha n transpose. So, this is the system of first order equations, which is equivalently uh, written from the 4.2, which was in turn written from 4.1. So, this 4.1 is equivalent to 4.2 that is the system of first order equations and 4.2 can be then in the matrix form can be written equivalently like this 4.3. Now, uh, here this is reduced equivalently to the integral equation like this y x equal to y at x 0 plus integral x 0 to x. Here you have this a y s plus b s d s. So, this is like you you have this a is a uh, because all these a's a's are functions of x. So, this actually a is also function of x. So, we will write it like this a s y s like this. Now, this is a particular case of uh, this one y at x 0 plus x 0 to x something like f s y s d s. So, here the Picard's theorem states that if this function f, where f is uh, this form here in this particular case. So, Picard's theorem states that if this f is Lipschitz continuous, in the second argument variable. So, let us write the dependence here. If this f x y is Lipschitz continuous in the second variable y, that is it satisfies this norm, this is the R n norm some ellipses constant L such a condition is called ellipses uh, continuity, which is stronger than the continuity and and f is continuous in x on this interval a b then 4.3 has a unique solution 
this 4.3 is actually initial value problem because here uh, this is the initial point and from this point the solution should evolve satisfying this equation. So, that is what is called the initial value problem. So, this has a unique solution. So, we have to verify only that this f x y here is in this case we have this thing here a x y plus b x. So, we have to check only the Lipschitz continuity. So, here because here a and b uh, since the components of uh, this a are continuous. So, therefore, the matrix a is continuous and f x y 1 minus f x y 2 will be a x y 1 minus y 2 because this will cancel and so norm of this. So, norm of this f x y 1 minus f x y 2 will be less than equal to this this matrix norm into this. Now, uh, since a i uh, this a, let us say a is of the form a i j x, where a i j are like this, most of these are constants only the last row has uh, these as functions of x and they are continuous and a i j are continuous on a b. Therefore, hence this absolute value a i j x is bounded by some number m and so a this norm a this is dependent on x. So, norm a x is less than equal to here each one is less than uh, that. So, if, if you take uh, the this is defined as maximum of a i j x you can define any norm those are equivalent here for the matrix uh, either this or if you define uh, summation a i j or uh, or the Euclidean norm. So, various norms are there this norm let us say this is called infinity norm and there are other norms a x 2 that is summation a i j square square of this summation this double sum over i and j or the other norm this one norm that is double sum a i j x mod a i j x sum over i. So, all these norms are equivalent these norms are equivalent on. So, you can use any norm here on this matrix and therefore, here therefore, this will be bounded by some number like it will be n square. I mean in each or this will be in this if you use this maximum norm then it will be bounded by m times y 1 or some number l we can take whichever we take. So, there is some number l. where l is dependent on any of those uh, norms. It is independent of x in this case and therefore, we have this Lipschitz continuity as well as since a i j's are continuous and these b, j, b the components of b are all continuous functions and therefore, uh, this f will be continuous uh, in the first variable x. So, hence Picard's theorem implies the existence of
a unique solution of 4.3 in turn of 4.2 and 4.1. So, that is where we have the existence of this. We need to verify only that the coefficients are continuous function in an, and the right hand side the non homogeneous function is continuous on the given interval and we will have the existence of initial value pro at any point starting uh, in any point uh, lying in the interval. So, next we have uh, uh, these functions. So, here let us consider the n functions phi 1, x, phi 2, x and so on and phi n x. So, Ronskian of this phi 1, phi 2, phi n is called Ronskian. So, this is the determinant like this phi 1 x, phi 2 x and phi n x and second row we get phi 1 prime x, phi 2 prime x and phi n prime x and like this we continue and then phi 1 n minus 1 at the derivative, phi 2 n minus 1 at the derivative and so on to phi n n minus 1. So, this determinant is called the Ronskin of n functions and we see that if the, we have the result if phi 1, phi 2 and phi n are linearly independent solutions of 4.1, then this Ronskin is then w of phi 1, phi 2 is not 0, it is a function of all that at x is not 0 for all x in a b. And converse is if uh, this Ronskin vanishes at any point x in the interval, then these phi 1, phi 2 are linearly dependent. So, that is what we have in this Ronskin case. Then we consider the Jacobian also. So, Jacobian here what we will consider is the functions u 1, u 2, u n and these are functions of x 1, x 2, x n. So, these are functions x 2, x 1, x 2 and so on x n. Then this Jacobian of or it is denoted like this del u 1, u 2, u n over del x 1, x 2, x n. So, this is defined by the following determinant that is del u 1 over del x 1, del u 2 over del x 2 and sorry del x 1, del u n over del x 1 and then the second row del u 2 over del x 1, del u 2 over this should be u 1 and this should be x 2. So, del u 2 over del x 2 
del u n over del x n and so on. And then last one will be del u 1 over del x n del u 2 over del x n and so on. It can be written in the row wise or column wise, because we know that a a transpose at the same determinant. So, it does not matter which way we write, we can as well write this in the rows as columns. So, we get the same thing here and so it can be written row wise or column wise. So, the uh, this is what is called the Jacobian of these n functions u 1, u 2, u n, which are assumed to be differentiable partially with respect to x 1, x 2, x n. So, the Jacobian of these n functions uh, with respect to x 1, x 2, x n uh, will be defined like this. In particular, here when we have the change of transformation here. So, this integral let us say the triple integral if we consider over certain uh, region r here, then f x y z d x d y d z. So, if we change x to let us say x is a function of u v w, y is a function of u v w, z is a function of u v w like this. So, then uh, this can be written as the region r will be changed to r dash and this f here will be actually let us say this is f dash u v w and then you will have the absolute value of the Jacobian del x y z over del u v w. So, this is the Jacobian and you take the absolute value, the bar is for the absolute value of this. So, we should if it comes out to be negative, we remove that negative sign, if it is positive, we retain it as it is. So, you have d u d v d w. So, that is what we have the change of rule like it is an extension for the one dimensional case supposing that you are taking a to b uh, f x d x and x is a taken as a function of t, then this changes to alpha to beta f of x t like this and d x by d t d t. So, that is the change of variable rule and it is the generalization of this of the one dimensional case in the general three variables or any n variable one can extend it. Then we have uh, we have already mentioned this surface uh, for area formula that is here we have this integral which we have mentioned already earlier over this x y z and this is the domain in the x y plane and let us say the surface over this is defined by z x y. So, here uh, this any point here is x y 0 z component is 0 here and let us say this is here. So, this is x y z which is a function of x y. So, here uh, we take this element area here the d x d y and over this we form this beam kind of a thing. And so, this uh, beam will have certain area here on top like this shaded area and then we uh, vary these variables x y 0 here over this domain and we get the whole surface area which is given by this double integral d square root of 1 plus z x square 
plus z y square d x d y. It will turn out to be a particular case of the general surface integral, we will see in a short while. Then also we have this Taylor theorem for general n variable case. for several variables so suppose that this f is a function of x1 x2 xn and here we write it as the in the neighborhood of uh, this let's say we have xi 1 xi 2 xi n. So, uh, we want to expand this in the neighborhood of this uh, fixed point xi 1 xi 2 xi n. So, this will be expanded like this plus you have x. So, summation here summation over i equal to 1 to n x i minus j i i and then you have del over del x i of this f and the next term will be would be plus 1 upon factorial 2 then same thing here summation of this i equal to 1 to n x i minus j i i del over del x i square. Here a square will be taken in algebraic sense and uh, of this operator evaluated f and like that we go and these are to be finally, evaluated at j i i coordinates. So, that is what we will write it as evaluated at j 1, j 2, j n. If this thing evaluated at xi 1, xi 2, xi n plus 1 and like this we will have 1 over any fact integer n factorial n like this summation and x i minus j i i equal to 1 to n del upon del x i power n and f then evaluated at j 1 j 2 j n. Here uh, these will be uh, the powers will be taken in algebraic sense you have for example, if you have only two terms then a plus uh, like del x over uh, del over del x 1 plus del x over del x 2 square of that we will have in that operator sense it is squared a square plus b square plus twice a b like that. So, that is the general formula for the Taylor series expansion. Now, we come to the surface integral general surface integral. Now, here what we have is like this some surface s is given here like this and we want to uh, here again the function f is given at each point on the surface. So, here x y z point p is moving on this surface and uh, there is a function f x y z define at each point on this, then we would like to consider what do we mean by this integral over this surface. Let us say this is B surface. So, over B of f x y z d s, this is capital S. Now, what do we mean by this? This is like you partition this surface in this way
you partition the surface in this way and uh, let us say each. So, S is partitioned as delta S 1, delta S 2, let us say this is delta S 1, delta S 2 and so on like this we enumerate them. And uh, here let us say x i, y i, z i is a point in delta s i. So, then we consider this sum s n that f of x i, y i, z i i equal to 1 to capital N times delta S i. Now, if uh, this limit, so here these uh, surfaces are partitioned in such a way in these uh, sub surfaces such that the maximum surface area goes to 0. So, that is what is to be ensured here. So, that we do not do only partition this or and then leave uh, certain other elements that should not be done. Each element should be partitioned so that its area goes to 0. So, this if this limit as n tends to infinity such that this maximum surface area maximum so that maximum or delta s i goes to 0. That is what we have to ensure so, and if this limit exists, if limit, if limit exists, then we define it, we denote it as over this B f x y z d s. So, one has to ensure what are the sufficient conditions that uh, uh, because this is a Riemann sum and we need to expect that this sum should not depend uh, the limit should not depend on the uh, way we partition it. So, therefore, uh, we will see that the sufficient conditions are f has to be continuous on this uh, surface as well as on the boundary of this surface here and this boundary should be uh, piecewise uh, smooth. That means, at each point here, here if the on the surface it should be such that the normal should be uh, continuous in each patch like you could have surfaces like this and like this. So, in these two patches the normal n should be. So, here everywhere normal n cap will be continuous here, it will be continuous here. So, this so what it should happen on that surface. So, surface should be uh, partitioned in such a way that on each subsurface uh, partitioned area the normal should be continuous so, and this f is continuous everywhere. Then you can see that this limit will not depend upon the manner which we partition it and so that limit will be independent of the way we define the partition. So, this is what is called the surface area of this B uh, and where the function surface integral of the function f over this surface uh, B. Now, how do we evaluate this? Evaluation of this will be done as we know how to evaluate the integrals over uh, two dimensional areas on a plane. So, that is what we want to use here. We will actually see that this surface area will be this surface integral b f x y z d s is actually will turn out to be here r is the projection of the surface on uh, the u v plane and it will be f x y z and uh, you have square root of e 
f minus g square and d u d v, where this x, y, z will be functions of u and v. We can see that actually uh, surface S is represented as, uh, so here the surface S is like this and any at any point here the position vector let us say this O P, this R is the position vector of this. So, this R is a function of u v, which will be like x u v i plus y u v j plus z u v k. So, this surface can be described by two parameters u uh, v. So, that position vector on this surface O p vector vector like this will be given by these uh, two parameter functions x, y, z like this. So, x i plus y j plus z k, uh, where x, y, z are functions of u and, u and v. So, that is what where you will be having certain a 2 or alpha, beta and v will have gamma, delta ranges like this. So, here if you see that how actually this comes out to be like this. So, on the surface we have like this. So, if we consider this as v equal to constant will give you uh, let us say u curve. So, this is v equal to constant. When we restrict parameter to a constant we get a curve on uh, the surface and like this it will be uh, this is v equal to constant that is u curve and let us say u equal to constant will give you another curve like this and then the surface will be uh, actually spanned by these kind of curves. So, here we can see that a tangent this is the point p here and tangent is given by r u the derivative and then element area here element length will be like this t u. And similarly, here tangent here will be r v d v. So, this curved element area at this point like this, this is the surface d s. So, d s is actually d s will be given by uh, the area of the parallelogram formed by this. So, that is given by r u cross r v d u d v. So, absolute value of this and d u d v is anyway positive. So, it comes out of that. So, that is what we will have to see that uh, this d s comes out to be the cross product uh, absolute value. We know that uh, area of the parallelogram formed by e and b is given by uh, the absolute value of the cross product. And so, uh, here if we calculate r u like this. So, that is x u i plus y u j plus z u k. Similarly, r v is x v i plus y v j plus z v k. And so, r u cross r v will be, we know that uh, this, we use this formula here is this square will be actually equal to r u uh, dot r u into r v dot r v minus r u dot r v square. This can be seen because uh, we know that for any given, uh, given vectors a and b, a cross b is mod a mod b uh, sin theta and then some unit vector in this direction. Let us say u cap in this direction where u cap is a unit vector. So, this is a 
B here and U cap is perpendicular to this plane formed by A cross B. So, this is A, this is B. So, this is the plane spanned by A and A B vector. So, here this A cross B is perpendicular to that plane. So, uh, it unit vector you if you take just like this. So, absolute value of this square will be a square b square sin square theta. So, because unit vector has uh, magnitude 1, so we get this and so this can be written as one minus cos square theta and so the we get a b square of this minus this is a square mod a square mod b square times cos square theta which is nothing but the dot product. So, we get so this is a dot b the square of that. So, that is what we use here. So, we got the same thing here for this we can use uh, this one. Now, so therefore, hence this r u cross r v square we got here this. So, uh, replacing a and b by r u r v. So, here you got r u dot r u like this dot and b is r v dot r v minus this is r u dot r v square. So, taking a equal to r u and b equal to r v. So, we get this. Now, uh, this r u is nothing but, so, uh, so this is x u square plus y u square plus z u square. Symbol here x v square plus y v square plus z v square and uh, minus this is. So, here x u dot x v plus y u dot y v plus z u dot z v. So, this is what we got which is nothing but in our this denoted as E and this denoted as F and this is minus g square. So, E F minus g square. So, therefore, we get R u cross R v this as square root of E f minus g square. So, that is what, so this is E and this is f and this is g square and that is what we have here. So, in particular uh, for the flat surfaces, this will reduce to our uh, the earlier case which we had here in the this case. We will see that this also comes out from the uh, our formula, general formula for the surface integral like this here. So, with this I stop my lecture and next we will consider some more concepts and finally, we will move on to the introduction of uh, main topics on the calculus of variation. Thank you very much for viewing this lecture.